Um, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on during the symposium, the Ngunnawal and the Nyambri people and so many other clans who visited and uh, met on this land. Thank very much Paul House for his eloquent and beautiful welcome to us this morning. Um, I pay honour to his elders and the elders of the Ngunnawal and the Ambri, past and present, and also acknowledge any other Indigenous or First Peoples who are here today. Um, David, Simon, Vivian Lovell, artists, curators and friends. Um, it is the centenary and one of the prime, I suppose, motives around the centenary and the celebration of 100 years since it na its naming has been to change perceptions about Canberra. Um, you've all been given the program in your, in your conference bag, the telephone book of the program that it is, and I believe that that demonstrates um, a great deal about Canberra, um, a great deal that is not known about its strength of natural, its natural cultural calendar, the things that happen every year, the fertile group of artists, young artists and old, experienced and emerging, that happen here in Canberra, and all the kind of things that... Um, go on here that are not noticed when all people do is think about this as the seat of federal government. I've made a couple of impassioned speeches, one at the National Press Club last year, which was called Taking the Name of the Capital in Vain and referring to that habit of journalists to refer to every um, particularly bad decisions. In fact, when it's good decisions of the federal government, they tend to say the federal government. When it's a bad, bad, unpopular decision, they tend to say Canberra just raised your taxes. Or um, there are some absolutely hideous ones that have the imagery of horror, of bloodletting, of hanging, of murder. Um, Canberra uh, forced Timorese people off the boats, etc. Um, pretty wild stuff and all about the power of language to make the rest of Australia associate with Canberra with only those disagreeable things from time to time that they think the federal government does. This year has been all about doing something else about Canberra, about showing its liveliness, its invention, its boldness ever since that first decision to give the uh, commission for a new city for a very young nation at the time, just 10 years old, when the decision was, when the competition was announced, which the Griffins won, um, to give that to two people who were spiritual uh, in the highest order, theosophists, and really believed in the, be the city beautiful and the garden city, and placed in this landscape um, a really beautiful city. But that was a very, very bold decision by those people at the time, and I suppose many of the things that um, we've tried in the centenary to do is to underscore the continuing boldness, both in art and in science, in so many ways, indeed in nurturing a pretty successful democracy if we say that you know we may not like it but it's the best that we can see so far it's a pretty successful democracy and we have that moment where we know many many people do jump on leaky boats boats in order to come to this country because it's such a su successful democracy the other thing I think that's associated that's not just ignoring the local life and the local invention is just to simply think that Canberra is boring that it's filled with uh, public servants who interestingly don't wear cardigans anymore they're much cooler than that but that image still prevails somehow amongst people that it's filled with people walking around in grey cardigans, very, very odd, or beige cardigans. So one of the things that we've tried to do during the centenary is say, well, if your, if your belief of Canberra is that it's like this, it's flat and boring and does nothing, what the centenary has tried to prove is that Canberra is actually like that, full of activity, wild things. And then what the centenary has done has commissioned a whole lot of things. We have more than 20... Uh, art commissions and commissions of other kinds in addition in the centenary year um, and to show people what a great place it really is, not without its uh, uh, faults as any city, not without its poor, um, not without its disadvantaged, but in fact a really very, very interesting city indeed. And my feeling is that the national conversation has changed, that um, when I go around various states in Australia, um, I, and, and indeed from my colleagues overseas, I am getting a different conversation. There is not just government to talk about, but there is art and science and all the other things that we've tried to underscore. It's been a place and no... no um, 
more encouraged, I think, than by David Williams and his time at the School of Art, which has created a fertile artistic subculture here. And it was one of the things that 20 years ago I enjoyed most about this place, and that is coming to direct the National Festival of Australian Theatre, the first place that gave me an opportunity to be the artistic director of a festival. And what I fell in love with, not knowing all that much about Canberra, was this incredibly thriving subculture that existed here and how much you could call upon with local artists, local projects, fabulous conversations, etc. Um, that is alive at the moment and the other thing that we know about Canberra anyway is that the Australian story is no better told in any city than in the national capital. That's largely because of the large cultural and collecting institutions that are here, places like the National Gallery, the National Portrait Gallery, the Archives, the Museum, the Mint, uh, the Australian War Memorial, etc. There are 11 major national institutions and if you think that the library alone holds every book ever published in Australia, Australia, then the resource here is absolutely amazing. At this moment in particular, the Canberra story has never been better told. If you have any time while you're here, those of you from interstate, um, we start at the National Museum of Australia with Glorious Days, 1913, which sets the context of a very optimistic and idealistic time in the country at, at, at that time. Nobody, um, nobody imagines really that in 1913 people were uh, not thinking about war, but they were not. It was incredibly optimistic. If you go from there to the National Archive, quite, quite close to here, you have the Design 29 exhibition, which is all about Marion and Walter's winning design. Marion's exquisite etchings are on show, and they are really on show because they are so fragile, but these were the things that influenced the decision that they would be the winners. Um, and uh, at the National Library of Australia, Dream of a Century, the, the Griffins in Australia, all about their time here. And if you really rushed, it's either today or tomorrow, which is the last day, very, very close, five minutes walk. The Gallery of Australian Design has our 20 entries and the winners and shortlisted for our hypothetical competition, well, international design competition for a hypothetical capital city for Australia in the 21st century. So bringing all those design ideas into the present and into the future. In planning the centenary and deciding on a year-long program, I had to start connecting in all sorts of ways with Canberra. Number one, I noticed that Canberra is still in love with hot air balloons. The balloon spectacular in March is amazing. I've rented in Yarralumla and there is nothing like that sound in the mornings. <laughs> going over your roof and you rush out in various states of disarray in your pyjamas with a camera and take these, the pictures of these absolutely remarkable balloons going overhead. Really is beautiful and it is probably the only city in the world where you can fly close to the seat of national government and not get shot down in a balloon. Um, it's something unique about this place. So I, I went along to the balloon spectacular and I had a look at the balloons and there was a kind of kookaburra, which looked kind of interesting, and a, and a, a cocky or something. And uh, there was also, in addition to the plane-shaped balloons, a box. And when I looked at it, it was the Libra tampon box. Um, and it wasn't all that inspiring. Indeed, as Patricia has talked about balloons, um, it was, uh, it was a, an advertising piece for Libra. And I just thought to myself, I wonder if we could do better than that. And the person that came immediately to mind was Patricia Piccinini. Because of her connection with the organic, with the natural world, but yet the imaginative world, with her deep questions about evolution and her amazing physical skills to go to her studio in Melbourne and to see the clay room, the uh, modelling room on the computers, the hair room, uh, the, the pelts that are hanging up for this hair by hair layering of pieces. I couldn't think of anyone better than to sculpt a new hot air balloon. It was in this building that after Patricia had given a speech with her beautiful stags were on show, as they are again now, she'd given a speech. We had lunch. I was allowed to join lunch up in the members' lounge and said to Patricia, what would you think about a hot air balloon? She leapt, uh, absolutely leapt at the opportunity. Um, and here, two and a half years later, Sky Whale has taken to the air and is somewhere landing now. We're not quite sure where, um, but 
In the basket are uh, Patricia's husband, Peter, also a sculptor, and her two children, so safe landing is all I can say. <coughs> first of all then, let's look at a, a video clip of the first flight of the Sky Whale. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Patricia Piccinini. Um, well, thanks for coming today. It's been a very special day for me. Uh, it's the birth of this project, uh, literally, um, and sort of her real introduction to the Australian public. So it's, thank you for sharing it with me. Um, I've been working on this project for two and a half years, so it's, it, I, I, it's been huge. So I've tried to condense it into about six points because there's so much to say about it. Um, but uh, I think I, I'll manage this way. So the first point is um, the sky whale is a sculpture rather than a balloon. Um, when Robin asked me to make this work, I was thrilled because I actually work across a lot of different media, fiberglass, silicon, video, drawing, photography. And so I'm used to working different media um, and the challenges that they present. Um, and the first thing I, I said to Robin, I said, 
um, great, but it, it will be part of my work, won't it? I will be able to do what I want to do. And to her absolute credit, she immediately said, of course. Um, and, and, and that's very meaningful because I, didn't, I wasn't restricted. I didn't have to do a portrait of, of um, Walter Bolly Griffin and Mary Money. I do absolutely um, admire their work, um, especially coming from Canberra, but I wasn't limited to that. It, it, I could do whatever I wanted, and so it wasn't going to be a non sequitur. It was going to be something that was integral to my practice and made sense. And that's really important because that's how you get the most out of an artist when they can do what they want to do. Um, so um, the next thing I thought about was that, well, I, I actually come from this place and I'm very aware of the, um, the layout of the city because I lived in it. And I think in some ways it, it's inspired a lot of my work. My work is actually about the the changing definition of what we consider natural and artificial. That is actually at the base of everything I do, literally. And I think in some ways it must, must come from living in this place because um, living in a city that's been imposed on a natural environment, a very symbolic city uh, a plan, uh, it's always been, traveling through it, it's always, it's always been p part of my growing up part of you know, riding around the artificial light that's been imposed in this place. But it's natural. Um, it's all these, all these interesting um, connect, sort of um, ways of being in the world. And so I thought to myself, well, yes, I'm going to try and emulate the same idea. And it makes sense to do that. I can, I can do this. Uh, I can make a big, huge artificial work that has a seemingly natural um, a look and feel. Um, and that's why I wanted to create a kind of creature. I mean, I do that anyway, but I, it, it was incredibly opposite this time. Um, and that's why I've, I've spent a lot of time trying to create a character in her. And in fact, um, you don't see many naturalistic type balloons. They're mostly caricatures and very simplified and they're very commercial looking and they're very bright. And um, the, the balloon company that I work with actually went to great lengths to make the printing look very natural looking. It's something that they actually hadn't done before. The other thing I was thinking when Robin approached me, I mean, I'm often always really thinking about evolution, but at that time I was thinking about um, the idea that we all came from the same bit of pond scum. We were all emanated from this bit of um, sort of bacteria and the world, the life came, all, we all come from, we all share the same ancestor. We all come from the same place. I mean, our, um, our cells divide the same way yeast does. I mean, it's so, it's so dramatically linked to everything on this planet. But um, at that time, I was thinking how very different animals occupy equivalent ecolo ecological niches um, in different environments. Like, for example, whales are mammals, but they've adapted to live in the aquatic world of fishes. So, um, they, they, so their evolutionary route was they came out of the sea, came to land, became the sort of hoofed mammals, sort of like small horses, and then went back into the sea and became gigantic and intelligent. But my idea was what if they'd gone somewhere else? What if they'd taken to the sky? What might that creature look like? And that's the birth of the sky whale. Um, it's strange, but it's also very conceivable. And it's a, it, because it's a public work, it, it had to have that duality of oddness, but also kind of strangely plausible. And so when I sat down to, to draw my ideas out, and in fact all my works start from this point, from drawing, whether they be um, a silicon work or a, a 
bronze work or whatever it is. It starts from drawing. Um, I, I thought, I'm not going to draw a balloon. I'm just going to draw something that flies. And that's quite different because the, the, the normal shape of a, the classic and, in fact, the best shape for a balloon is this shape, and that's why they're all the same shape because they fly the best. Um, and in fact, inside the sky well, there is that shape. You have to have that shape to be able to fly through the sky and control it um, with hot air. Um, uh, but I didn't draw the shape. I draw the, 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 um, the cre my creature, the sky well, in any way I wanted it, the Anisha to fly. And she also has a skeletal structure that we share as well. Um, and that's where the, the ten memories come from, um, because we all have these, well, like with seals and with whales and with monkeys and dogs and humans, we all have, we all share the same um, skeleton, but it, it sort of changes in proportion. And, and, and sh the, the fingers became the memories. So th that's part, part of the, the, th the logic behind it. And, and I just went all out. I just did what I wanted. And I just thought, I'll send it off. I'll 3D model it in the studio. I'll send it off. And I thought that they'd come back to me and say, oh, that's too hard. We can't do that. All those 10, those ten p independent pieces on this side, not possible. Um, but to my great joy, they, they came back to me and said, we can do it. Um, and I really think that what they were doing was saying, we're going to see what we can do at this point. We've never done anything like it. This is Cameron's Balloons in, in um, Bristol. Um, they're a special balloons company. Um, and I think they were just trying to see, you know, what were their limits. Um, and they, they did everything they could to stay as close to my plan as possible. And the result was almost exactly what I drew. And I was so pleased about that. Hardly any compromises at all. And so what's inside, as I said, is the hot air balloon, which is round, and all the other pieces are appendages, and they're filled with cold air. And they're quite, cold air is quite heavy. And that's why you can only have three people in it, because it's, it, the whole thing is heavier than a normal balloon, and it's also got a lot more fabric in it. it they work so hard on it, they work through Christmas to get this made. Um, so it was a, an effort, a really good effort for everybody. The second point that I wanted to talk about was um, the sky well floats into our lives and she just appears to us. Now, this idea came from, um, well, I, I used to live in Fitzroy in an old um, factory and we used to have these views over the, the city. And the first time we um, woke up in the place, I went outside and I, there were these, there was this like balloons wafting over our house. And I just thought, wow, this is an auspicious moment. I'm lucky to be in this place. I'm lucky to be alive. And that was, that was it maybe, that was the balloons. And I think that balloons have that quality anyway. They just, they just, they just kind of bring joy to people's lives in a way that maybe, I don't know, bronze doesn't. You know, it's, they just have that quality. And I, and I wanted to bring that to the work. Um, uh, so she has a kind of a benign presence. She's massive, but she's not threatening. And she has a kind of inclination to wonder. And you can't be sure where she'll be or um, how long she'll be around because you can't control where a balloon goes because the wind does that. Um, you, you, can't, you can't plan. In fact, I'm really glad to know where my family's dropping down because they could be anywhere. Um, and I guess spotting her in the sky, would I hoped, would be an auspicious event for the viewer. And I really wanted to create something wonderful that evoked a sense of wonder that might make people smile or think or maybe even both. And um, that's, not, that's not something that contemporary art often aspires to do, to make people smile, because um, it may be seen as not serious. 
Um, and that's, you know, that's a fine line I, thread, I, I tread because um, my work is deadly serious, actually. It's about very strong um, uh, sort of contemporary questions and, and the ethical implications of the um, decisions that we make about nature and the way we change nature. I think it's incredibly relevant to the, to, um, the world we live in, not just the art world, but the, the, the contemporary world. But at the same time, I really want people to be able to connect with it. Um, and pa part of that is bringing something like surprise to their lives. And surprise is something that we rarely get, um, because, or joy even, uh, because our world is so super saturated with stuff that we're sort of overwhelmed by it. Or at least that's how I feel um, a lot of the time. So what is the sky well anyway? That's the third point. Um, now, when I make my work, I often have a strong narrative behind it because that actually uh, dictates the, the, the morphology of, of, of what I make, the shape and, and look of things. But this time, I didn't want to have an official narrative. But I knew that I could set the parameters, and, and um, the parameters were something like, well, she could be a long-lost species that's maybe evaded our discovery for millions of years, or um, some, you know, something, in, something like the giant squid that we've only recently captured three seconds of on film, and we know nothing about this creature, and it's enormous. Uh, it, she could be something like this, and she's evaded our, our um, speculation in the, you know, by, by hiding in the deserts all these, all, this, all these years. Or maybe she could be uh, some sort of genetically modified animal, and she's the product of cutting-edge technology. Or maybe she could be a myth mythological creature, something that's very symbolic and stands for something else. Um, or maybe she was none of these things. Maybe she was something else. Maybe she was just her own thing. Um, and I knew that the majority of people um, who'd, uh, who would see her w wouldn't necessarily know the context for her. Um, and they would come to it fresh. So the first thing that they would say was like, what is it? Uh, like, really, what is it? Um, and and obviously they'd be able to say, well, it's a creature, um, but the rest of it would be up to them. And that is what's interesting, that they make the narrative. Not because I'm too lazy to make the narrative, because I could actually easily do that, but because I really wanted to engage people. And interestingly, um, I've just been told that there's been a Twitter account that's set up, which is all about the origins of the sky whale, and people all over uh, have got their, their own stories about where she comes from. And she's, she's, she's only been born today. You know, it's, and that's, that's what's exciting for me, to reach into that part of contemporary culture. I mean, I love being part of the art world. I love, I love museums. But it's very exciting to be part of life outside. It's really wonderful, even if people dump on you a lot. Um, so, on the one hand, it's very much a work of wonder um, and showing people something extraordinary that floats into their lives and leaves them pondering. And, 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 um, and then I, I hope that it's a real catalyst for conversation, um, not just about, about the work, but also about art. Like, what is art? What should art do? What, what should art talk about? Th those kinds of things. So the fourth point is um, the sky whale is an artwork that strayed outside of art's natural habitat. Yeah. So she exists outside of the gallery space and she literally does that. She's in the sky, but she does that also on a much more structural level. Um, so she passes overhead, and people don't know why or where she's come from, and there's no label saying this is an artwork. Like, I usually have lots of labels with my name on it, and, 
and all sorts of things that give it authority. Or you, like like the, the museum's label or the, the magazine's label or the website's label. Well, this doesn't have any of those things. And, um, and secondly, it's an, also a form that's not generally associated with an artwork. It's very few art balloons, if any, I imagine. Um, and, gen and also balloons are associated with much more commercial messages, like buy this sanitary product or drink this champagne. So then people aren't, they can't read it easily. They don't know how to connect with it. Like, sh what should I be seeing this? What should I be buying? What should I be thinking? And in this, there isn't, there isn't that. It's not telling you what to think. It's much more experiential and, 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 and sort of uh, emotive in some ways. I'll talk about that. You know, if I, if I made a bronze and I put it, I do make bronzes, and if I, and I put that in, in an unusual situation, people would still recognise it as an artwork, whereas it's not the same for a balloon. It's, 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 it's a real challenge to create a work of art like that, where there, it doesn't have the sort of obvious signs of artiness. But also it's an amazing opportunity because you know, it can be a truly enigmatic object. And um, it's, it's, um, it can be a presence in people's lives where they have no preconceived ideas of it, as you do with art. So the fifth point is that um, Skywell is, is my reflection on nature and evolution. So Skywell does celebrate the wonder of nature, and I know that's weird because Skywell doesn't actually exist. But she does, um, she does capture the qualities that I find most interesting and amazing about nature. So um, nature has the extraordinary capacity to adapt to any environment. Like there's no place on earth where there is n no life, and that life is super adapted to it. Um, and the sky whale may appear fantastic, but when you compare it to real life, I think it pales in comparison. I mean, I mean the life on this planet is extraordinary. And, and I think that's one of the things that this work can do. It can, it can, it can, it's a reference to real nature. Um, so, um, so when we look at, say, I've just made a work about a blobfish, which is in um, the Canberra Museum and Art Gallery, which is actually a, a real fish that lives off the coast of South Australia and is being um, trawled to extinction because it lives 2,000 feet uh, deep in, in, under the water where there are other crabs. And it, they're trawling for crabs, for cheap meat. And um, they're picking up these, these fishes. They're called the blobfish. Um, and the blobfish is a gelatinous fish, and it's um, inedible. So they're just, throw, they're just throwing it away. But this fish is amazing. It's completely adapted to its environment. Um, it, 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 it's got the same density as seawater. And that's why it can tolerate the pressure on its body of all this mass of water. It's one of the few fish that stays with its young. Um, it's, it, yeah, it's just an extraordinary creature. And um, I, I don't think that I could have ever imagined anything like that. It, and my whale, even though she is beautiful and amazing, is not as extraordinary as that, that blobfish that's being, becoming extinct for no good reason. So I guess the point here is that I'm trying to make that um, when we look up at the sky whale and wonder what, what she's for, it, it might remind us that nature is not necessarily for us. Nature just, just is, and we're just lucky to be able to be here to see her, to see it. So the last point is, um, and it's 
an important point, I think, because this is the real, the, this is where the depth of the work comes from. I think most people, um, especially in the media, um, well, actually, no, not in the media, but just at first glance respond to the spectacle of the work. Um, but for me, it's, it's, it has a, a much, have some, this work has much deeper implications um, because it relates and fits into the, the rest of my practice um, in, in, in terms of the work I'm doing with evolution. So evolution is a process whereby things change in order to survive in, um, in the changing environments. And natural selection, uh, where things happen by accident. And breeding is where we uh, deliberately take an organism and change it to suit our needs. And then you add genetic engineering, that's, that's the world we live in. And so you have all these engines for evolution, and I find them very interesting because, um, yeah, they're very of, of our time and, and they shape the way we see things. And so with, with all my work, but especially this work, I'm asking things like, is there a difference between these types of evolutions? Um, like, is one better than another? Um, because maybe the only difference is, is that one is slower than the other. And um, could the sky whale have evolved naturally? Or could she have been engineered? And if she had been engineered, might we choose, might we have chosen to create her? And would, it, would, it, would this be an all right use of that kind of technology? I mean, that's what the work's about, really. Like, why do we change nature? Why would you? Um, and what would be the relationship that we might have to the creatures that we might create in the future? And with this work, I'm saying, well, maybe we might create something like this just because it's beautiful and joyful and amazing, like real nature. But actually, that's quite a radical thing to say because in our times, we think that we would change nature just to make our lives um, better. And lastly, would the world be a better place or a worse one if the sky well did exist? So. Thanks, Patricia. Thanks. Um, are we able to use, it's easier to have a conversation if we sit down, if we can have those microphones on, that'd be great. So um, we welcome your questions, but there are a couple of things that flew off what you said, Patricia, that uh, I'd like to raise. Um, uh, number one, um, indeed, if you go to the Twitter hashtag, a sky whale myth, you will find many stories evolving around the world about where she came from. And it's probably worth saying that um, it may well be due to the, uh, the local knee-jerk reaction before everybody had seen the balloon, but um, we have, as they say, gone viral. Uh, CNN took it up yesterday. Uh, overnight, it's in the UK Telegraph. So Sky Whale has an international presence, uh, Patricia. And what I'm terribly glad about, what I said at the breakfast this morning, is that there are many uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, that now know, understand at last that Canberra is the capital of Australia. Um, <laughs> it's been a hard one. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Sky Whale has her own uh, Twitter account. And I understand that yesterday she, she learned that Richard Branson was in the country and tweeted him and asked him if he'd like to come and have a ride. Uh, we haven't had anything back. And somebody this morning, I have to relate, said as they looked up, well, she's not quite so beautiful from underneath. And I said, neither am I. <laughs> so we share something very organic, I think, with the, with the sky whale. I think a couple of things that come up... Um, uh, just for those of you who are here in Canberra at the moment, it's interesting that the local response is very, as, as we always predicted, people would be, I don't know what it is and therefore I don't like it. Um, outside Canberra, the, the response is overwhelmingly positive and that's really fantastic. And, but there's, I think with all art, and I think it's something that um, Vivian Lovell brought up brilliantly last night, is that uh, the immediate response is always going to be... Um, difficult to control people. Again, the stuff outside the museum, will all, there'll always be an immediate effect. But again, there were many, many people here this morning at the launch that uh, quite specifically said, 
I didn't like it when I saw it, but of course they had never seen it till this morning, but it was a picture that they saw, it was an image that they saw. I didn't like it, but I eat my words. I really am in love with it at the moment. And I think, Patricia, that's something that you've found with your work overwhelmingly. Yeah, just generally most people find, find it quite... Um yeah, challenging and but you know, some, I find that it's those people who most vehemently react against it that that often come around and love it in the same intensity. You were saying yeah. this was this was what happened in Nashville when you exhibited there that the yeah. beautiful big ape-like creature suckling a more or less human child. Yeah. They wanted to put signs over it and and say this isn't suitable, and it yeah. ended up being the most popular piece in the entire exhibition. Mm, yeah. yeah. Um, two other things, I think, in relation to your subject, the subject matter of this uh, conference, um, is that the two things that have come up most powerfully for me with regard to Sky Whale are it was treated in the first couple of days from that image as if this was a beauty contest or a popularity contest. And I think that's really a big one that we need to grasp about art, that the assumption was it's not beautiful, therefore we can't like it. And yet, when I think of popular culture, if I think of Jurassic Park or I think of Star Trek or any of those uh, where, where, the, where the, what is it, where the creature, the wild creature, the wild things are, there are infinitely more threatening mm. looking creatures that people somehow accept in the medium of film or screen mm. that are loved by families, etc. But the minute it appears as something in your territory for real mm. um, or is about to come to your territory for real, there is a, oh, it's not beautiful, therefore it's not art and it can't be allowed. And doesn't that say something about how we consider art as well? Absolutely. It says we have these aesthetic qualities or these fashions um, and, w and we need art to be a specific way. And as soon as you kind of um, sort of tread beyond that or at the side of it, it's like, oh, don't know what to do, don't like it. Yeah. We, we, which, which is interesting because we're only looking at art in a very superficial way rather than a sort of deeper conceptual way. And, it's, and I think it's particularly a challenge for contemporary art and new yeah. work because this week in Canberra I opened um, uh, an exhibition at the Museum of Australian Democracy, again just a step away for all of you from interstate, um, and it's Arthur Boyd's political works. Um, and these are works that show a different side from that very celebrated Australian artist. It shows how he was a pacifist, how he did very many anti-war uh, pieces, and especially the ink on paper looks like the works of George Gross, who was sort of commenting on war from the German side, etc. Uh, he did a lot for the... He spoke out about the environment in this area, in the Shoalhaven and at Bundanon. Um, and they are very, very confronting pictures. But nobody says... Again, first of all, it's inside a gallery, so mm. the kind of people that may have responded to the sky well, won't go in and see that stuff. But mm. there is a, there is a, a very inter interesting response around that. The other one, um, the other big challenge, of course, and I, I think this comes into all our work in terms of art, but particularly public art, is cost. Um, you know, there's been huge arguments and they are going on because they're ongoing because they have now been politicised. The opposition here, the local opposition, is trying to jump on this to accuse the government of something terrible. Um, I've been on the media saying that uh, earlier this year, with great pride and part of the centenary program, Canberra hosted its... Ver after 100 years, can you believe it? It hosted its first international cricket match. And so in order to do this, lights on the Manuka Oval were put up at enormous expense. But in the end, eight hours of international cricket cost $600,000. And not a word is spoken. Four days of the international, uh, the Australian Golf Open, four days, $1.4 million. Proudly part of the centenary program, but not a word is spoken. But mm. suddenly there's a piece of art that cost 120, 170, minus the very generous philanthropic contribution, 120,000 plus running costs. And somehow this is a sin against humanity that one would dare to do that for, a, for some flippant balloon in the air. So I think this is you know, an incredible challenge mm. that we all have, that, that mm. art and particularly public art is such a soft target for yeah, accusations of spend. Yeah. And I think, Patricia, yeah. you said that this uh, marvellous company, there are only two companies that we believed anywhere could actually make the balloon mm. and that they, ha they have actually gave us a bargain. They worked Absolutely. so hard to make it yeah. cost uh, yeah. neutral, in fact. Yeah. yeah. 
So oh, I think it, I think it was cheap for what they did. I think we got a cheaper, yeah, yeah got a bargain. Absolutely. I love they, a bargain. They did. I love a bargain. <laughs> Each time I was talking about this work, I was reminded of wow. Yoko Ono in Liverpool. So the Liverpool Biennial, when I was in Liverpool, the Liverpool Biennial had um, a piece by Yoko Ono, and the streets of Liverpool had enormous banners, which were a breast on one and a fully hairy pudendum on the other. And these were down the streets of Liverpool. And of course, a riot broke out. The good burghers of Liverpool said, we, this is a, you know, exactly the same language. This makes a laughing stock of Liverpool, etc., etc." And Yoko Ono came out brilliantly. And the, the gift bags were the same. One side was a huge breast and the other was the pudendum. People would go to the exhibition at the Liverpool and walk along with a <laughs> sort of mons on their shoulder. And Yoko Ono came out and said, it absolutely beggars belief that anyone could find anything disgusting from the place we came from and the place we fed from. Uh, you know, yeah. that this is yeah. mother, this is our first experience yeah. of birth and mother, yeah. and was just amazed that anyone could find anything mm. difficult about that. But in, in our case, while we knew, and uh, you know, to the credit of the Chief Minister, um, she was eventually persuaded that this was absolutely legitimate mm. sculpture to go to mm. her public and has been a fantastic defender. Um, she said uh, the other day that she considered herself a Philistine in the arts and after defending and saying, I had no business to be censoring or telling an artist what to do, I stood before her and I said, I dub thee no longer a Philistine. So <laughs> she's really stood up for us in an, in an amazing way. And to mm. tell you the truth, I have been amazed that there hasn't been more made of that aspect of the sculpture. Rather, it's been, why isn't it Walter and Marion or why doesn't it look like Parliament House? House or something, and mm -hmm. how much it cost, which is a non argument. So, other questions? Yes. Is it we me? have one. Yep. Sorry, where are you? Up here. <laughs> there you are. Up in the back. Great. The cost in regional areas is of public art, and I've been fighting in our council, I've been 17 years now, for public art, and I'm now the arts and culture sp uh, sponsor for this year. My budget is nil, okay? But when the regions get the public art and get it in, it's just amazing how that town is then acknowledged and it grows in itself. And that's the thing I can't seem to get across. Uh, and this has just been so wonderful for me to come. As soon as I saw the public art thing, I thought, oh, that's, I've got to go. So my talk at council on Monday night is going to be just fabulous about the fabulous things that have been said last night and, tonight and today. But it's really hard, isn't it, to get that cost, which really gives esteem to the, the people. We've, we're a mining town. We've got huge slag heaps and all that horrible stuff that everybody just worries about the dust. But if we had some public art and something really that we could acknowledge and, uh, you know, our dairy industry from before and whatever, and at the Aboriginal area as well, it would be just so wonderful. And when regions get it, it really makes such a difference. And some regions have, but unfortunately it's not ours. <laughs> I, th I think there are means, though, for you to apply for money. I mean, there would be any number. I think Vivian, you're the, the artist in Rio, who makes the makes wonderful public art out of um, out of garbage and detritus, etc. Imagine there'd be any number of artists in Australia and indeed internationally who would love to come to the slag heaps and do something with them. And uh, <laughs> and and I think that there are means for you to to apply for some funding to to have an artist in residence to do that. I think uh, we, you should come and have a chat afterwards. You just have to do the first one, that's all. <laughs> yeah, we had a question here, I think. There was one there, yes. Hi. Um, first of all, I think um, everything that you say is fascinating. And the, the volume of people outside this morning um, is really fantastic to see because I think Canberra really does... The people of Canberra who do get sometimes a bit of a, a hard rap for being conservative and stuff, just seeing how many people are here this morning to witness that shows that I think the community wants these things, wants, you know, and really embraces them. Um, my question for you, though, is um, how influenced are you? I mean, a, a, a piece of public art like this for the Canberra Centennial, which is quite specific, how influenced are you by 
what you um, anticipate per people's reactions will be. D do you kind of factor that in when you're thinking about what you're going to do, or do you kind of dismiss and not kind of not let that influence your design? Um, so that's the first question. And then with something that is possibly controversial like this, where people you know do feel strongly both ways, how do you? Um, if you kind of may be anticipating this, how do you then kind of come to terms with that it's caused such a, a, a lot of interest and, you know, people are very vocal with their opinions? Do you kind of cope with that? Um, because obviously it's, it's a personal piece of work. You put a huge amount of time and effort into it. It's something very symbolic and meaningful to you. Um, I imagine it would be very hard to have criticism from um, people who maybe are not in the art field or, or anybody really. And how do you deal with, with those comments? Okay, so the first part of the question is um, I, I don't really uh, think about the audience's response um, when I make the work, other than, as I said before, I, I mean, I could easily make it, um, you know, something that's really, really super confronting, but, that's, but it doesn't occur to me because I don't, I'm not that kind of person. I like I, I'm 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 really not, um, so so I really it's a conversation and it's a, for me and I try to be as honest about um, what I think is important and interesting and beautiful as I can be, and there's a lot of sincerity in the work. Um, it's very genuine. There's no sarcasm. There's no irony. Um, so I there's no the sort of yeah it's it's really a heartfelt sort of proposition, like, here it is. It, um, and, I, and, I, and then I wait for people to come back. But at the same time, you know, I, I used to be very um, concerned with what people said, but I've had so much flack over the last 20 years that I don't, I don't listen anymore. Like, I know lots of people have been bagging the work, um, but I sort of think, oh, they'll come around. You know, I know that I know that you know, she will she will be a part of this culture, and um, she'll eventually win a place in their hearts and minds. And I, yeah, I can't let that um, deter me because yeah, it, it's just not a useful emotion. Um, I have to say that Patricia is far braver than I and far less sensitive. I didn't sleep a wink on Thursday night. I woke really? up on the hour going, why are you saying that about our beautiful commissioner? Why, why, why? And so I, I, I woke up and I, um, I sent Patricia an email and it was like giving her a big hug. It was the, such a beautiful and, and email. I was like, oh, dear Patricia, the work yeah. is wonderful and we love it. It's going to be great. And, you know, I hope you're not phased by all the things that everybody out there yeah. is saying. And Patricia writes back, oh, Robin, I'm really glad you love this guy. I don't care about any of that. <laughs> She's so much more resilient than I am, I can tell you. It's oh, yeah. brilliant. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think, you know, all great artworks, they do cause this conversation, which is very important to be had, and it raises a profile of, of public art, so it's fantastic, yeah, mm. thank you. Thank yep, you. there's someone here, yeah. Um, hi, I'm really interested in the selection process for the, the company that made the actual balloon. Did you just send a group of companies like drawings, or did you send some kind of 3D marquette? And then did you go over to Bris Bristol to kind of supervise what they were doing? I'll just answer yeah. first. The selection process had to be a very, very well documented um, expression of interest. We had to go out to companies. It's all documented. In the end, there were only two companies anywhere that can produce this kind of special shaped balloon. So you can get ordinary balloons produced uh, by, I think, one company in Australia, but there were um, very few choices. And in the end, there was, uh, first of all, a very intensive process about what would meet, because we've delivered the centenary directly out of the Chief Minister's Department of the ACT government, so not at arm's length, 
growth, there had to be a very, very strict regulatory process and it had to answer all the demands, both le legally and in terms of safety and all those things, before we could make the choice of the company. And it was only a choice between two. And the first choice of the company was simply that it satisfied all the regulations that had to be satisfied for the ACT government. And once we'd chosen the company, and there were a lot of conversations with Patricia about that, then she started to interact. So, Patricia, then. Yes, and then I had um, long and detailed um, sort of um, discussions about the work and how it could be made and, and so on. And then I finally went over there and um, s sort of oversaw the, the printing process because th that naturalistic feel to it, it's, it's, they haven't done it. They've done patterns but they haven't tried to replicate sort of that n natural skin tone. So, and also um, we had to match the printed stuff to, the, to the, the fabric that's not printed and that was quite a process as well because they had different qualities to them. So I went over there t to check the colors and to check the textures. Um, but I also went over there to um, see how it was, um, all the different pieces uh, w were put together, and it's thousands of them, and it's all done by hand. It's quite amazing. Um, so it sort of, sort of seems incongruous, doesn't it? It looks almost like a, some kind of man manufactured thing, but it's sort of, it's, and it is obviously, but it's made by people, seamstresses, um, that get, get there early and leave early to bring their children home. It's, 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 it's quite human. Yeah, so it was a long process, but um, Cameron's is, um, they're a great company, um, and they obviously have to be a serious company because um, they, ha they have an aeronautical engineer there because it is a flying machine and it has to be credited as such, and people's lives are at risk. I mean, balloons fall out of the sky all the time. <sighs> No, no, your children are safe. Yeah, it's okay. I, I, they're down now, but, but they do. So you, you have to be very careful. And you have to have a good pilot too. And, you know, luckily we have a great pilot that I'd really trust um, to fly her. I think there are a couple of things there too. Um, you know, there's been, in the, in the kind of tri tri the media trying to kind of reel the controversy out as long as they can, there's suddenly, oh, shock, horror, it's the balloon company, the, f the flying, not the makers, but the pilot and his company that actually owns it. Yeah. Um, intellectual property is vested in Patricia and yeah. she will say where it flies and under what conditions, but it's actually mm -hmm. owned somehow. How could a government possibly fund something that a commercial operator is going to own? Well, that took months and months of deliberation. Yeah. Patricia, in a sense, can't own the physical thing because it's got to be regularly maintained for safety, yeah. in a sense. And the ACT government doesn't fly balloons. It's not yeah. what it does. And it has yeah. no expertise in maintaining a balloon. So there, in the end, with advice from the government solicitor, there was only one person that could actually own it, and that was the company, so that they can keep it regularly, they can get it to its next appearance, etc. Mm. It was the only choice. The other thing that I'll say is there was an interesting that probably you don't, you may not even know about Patricia. There was an interesting internal trajectory of this piece because Patricia's original drawings came to us in a kind of powder blue and they were very beautiful and everybody went, oh, you know, well, maybe the memories will be a little bit problematic, but, you know, it's a nice friendly blue, etc. And then when Patricia started negotiating with Cameron's about the colour, they came back with pink and kind of elephant hide grey on the top and everybody went, oh, that's a bit scary. Is it all going to be all right? It's too, and, yeah, and, then sure, when yeah. it, and then when it eventually, when it got more real, mm. people went, oh, well, is it going to be... And when it eventually arrived, the last final drawings, and its, and its mouth had actually adopted a little bit of a smile, everybody went, oh, it's smiling, hooray! <laughs> it was such, a, such an interesting, humanly fallible process that everybody in the centenary team went through. It was absolutely fantastic. We have one last question. Um, sorry, I just uh, want to make a comment and, and particularly to thank Patricia for opening up the conversation because I think if we had had a conventionally beautiful balloon, the um, comment would have been very little. Everyone, no one would have um, batted an eyelid. And I think what's very interesting for me in part with your work is the way that 
it challenges ideas about beauty and things that people don't find beautiful. And I think while, and I took Vivian's point last night about there's a place for beauty, but is there also a place for things that aren't conventionally beautiful? And it worries me in our society that we have these notions that only that is kind of something we want to see and engage with. Mm -hmm. But clearly what you do is also bring out those other levels that people do want to talk about some of these issues. And um, sorry, just trying to say a lot in a little, little space, but um, I was thinking very much about this last night myself and how it was going to look because I obviously hadn't seen it like most other people. And I was coming towards the gallery today and um, there were a couple of little kids running in front of me with their parents and they said, oh, where is the ugly thing? And um, I thought, oh, that's, that's interesting. You know, they were really excited to see it. And, but as I walked around, what struck me when, when I saw the memories was how the delicacy that it was almost like wa a watercolour, you know, in the way that the balloon mm -hmm. had transformed that. Mm -hmm. And so just these many levels, and of course there are many more that are out there on the Twitter sphere at the moment in terms of myth and how we see it, but I just want to say a big thank you for opening up the conversation mm -hmm. in so many interesting ways. Thanks very much, and let's thank Patricia Piccinini for her work. <laughs>